Welcome everyone to another Eckerson Group webinar. Uh, the title of our webinar today is the best practices in augmented analytics techniques for driving adoption. Before we start, please use the Q&A button below to ask questions of our speakers at any time. We've reserved time at the end to answer your questions, but if appropriate, we'll address them dynamically during the presentations. And if you have a technical issue, please use the chat button to talk with our administrator. Also, a bit about Eckerson Group before we start. If you don't know us, we are a research and consulting firm that specializes in data and analytics. That's all we do. Our research team evaluates emerging technologies in the field and writes reports, articles, and white papers. Our consultants help Fortune 2000 companies develop data strategies, modernize their data architectures, data governance programs, master data management systems, and self-service and advanced analytics programs. And our analysts advise vendors on go-to-market strategies. Here's a list of some of our recent consulting clients, both North America and uh, Europe. And now let me introduce you to our speakers. First, my name is Wayne Eckerson, president of Eckerson Group and a longtime writer, speaker, and consultant in the data and analytics field. After I introduce our speakers, I'll provide a little context on augmented analytics based on multiple research reports that I've written on this topic. Once I finish my remarks, uh, Orla Cullen of SAP will then show us what augmented analytics looks like in practice using SAP Analytics Cloud. Orla is a solution manager for Augmented BI at SAP with more than 10 years of experience developing and implementing analytics and BI solutions, more recently with a focus on machine learning and AI. And we save the best for last. Our final speaker is Irina Likova. Uh, she is a BI and analytics solutions architect at Roach, a Swiss-based pharmaceutical and diagnostics company. She is very passionate about new technologies that drive business innovation and digitization. For this segment, Irina and I will dialogue about her experiences implementing a predictive analytics solution from SAP. So to talk about augmented intelligence, uh, it helps to briefly look at the evolution of intelligence as we know it today in the modern world. At the bottom of this diagram, you have human intelligence, where we use our brains to collect all kinds of personal experiences, which we can think of as raw data. We then synthesize those experiences by dividing patterns and connections among them to drive and make uh, business decisions. We call this human-based synthesis intuition, and it can be quite accurate in narrow domains, but wildly inaccurate in a majority of instances. Now, if you're watching this webinar, you've probably heard of business intelligence. This is where we use machines to collect the raw data from operational systems. And then we use BI tools to synthesize and summarize that data, visualizing trends of key metrics. We as humans then view those reports and dashboards and use our judgment to make business decisions. Now, the next run in the evolutionary ladder is augmented intelligence. This is where we have machines do more of the heavy lifting. Besides collecting data, we now use machine learning models to analyze that data, detect patterns and relationships, and even suggest actions for humans to take. Here, the human operator can accept, reject, or tweak the machine generator recommendations when making a decision. The culmination of this evolution is autonomous intelligence, where we allow the machines to do all the heavy lifting and make the decisions. Intelligent bots and autonomous vehicles are examples of autonomous intelligence. While many colleagues are looking forward to the age of autonomous cars, I personally am not. I live in Boston, and no matter how smart I think your car is, it's not going to navigate narrow, winding, one-way streets in our fair city, especially in a snowstorm while avoiding other half-crazed Boston drivers. <laughs> autonomous intelligence to me is more of a niche segment for well-known, repeatable, non-volatile processes. Think of high volume operational processes like airport trams and call routing. Uh, the bigger market I think is for augmented intelligence where we get the best of both human and machine generated intelligence. There are always exceptions to the rule that the data and the machine can't anticipate 
For instance, I know that Kelly Blue Book that I wrote about in a, in a past book uses augmented intelligence to create automobile valuation, valuations that it publishes. Uh, the machines generate 95% of the valuations that are published, but the human analyst still can override those valuations based on their experience and tactical knowledge of business conditions on the ground at the moment. Augmented intelligence makes the analysts at Kelly Blue Book much more productive, generating three to four times the number of valuations than in the past without statistical models from machine learning. So let's bring this discussion of intelligence down to earth a bit more. Um, there have been three generations of business intelligence, which is a market I've followed since the early 1990s. The first generation was largely IT driven, comprised of purpose built tools, one tool for every type of analytics you wanted to do, and then quickly consolidate those tools into BI suites uh, so you could buy all the tools at once. That was uh, in the 1990s. In the 2000s, we ushered in the era of self-service BI, where we introduced visual discovery tools and all-in-one analytic platforms that really empowered business users, not IT folks, to actually build reports and dashboards and analytics views for themselves. And then the final phase, which we're entering now, is uh, augmented BI, or augmented intelligence, as we've discussed where we're using the power of AI and machine learning embedded into our business intelligence tools to do a lot of that heavy lifting we talked about before and suggest actions that we might take, decisions we, we might make. So I wrote a report in 2018 called AI is the new BI, how algorithms are changing business intelligence and analytics. This is a chart from that report and it shows all the AI enabled features of the time that BI vendors were adding to their products. As you can see, it's quite a long list. It spans both casual users and power users and the full stack of BI functionality from reporting to analytics, to data preparation, model creation, and even model management. Not all of these features have hit the market yet, but uh, the vendors are making great progress in this area. Now, today I wanna to focus on four of the most popular and predominant AI features in BI tools. Uh, the first is natural language queries. This is the ability for users to type text into a search box and generate SQL queries, which automatically display as charts or tables. Essentially, this is Google for BI. It's a way to make BI accessible to all business users, not just to data savvy ones. The second is what I call assisted analytics. This is where algorithms run in the background to generate correlations with whatever a user clicks on in a chart or dashboard. Behind the scenes, the tools generate uh, natural language text and charts to describe the correlations or other reports that the user might be interested in examining. Assisted analytics features in BI tools are kind of like giving each and every user their own uh, data analyst. The third AI for BI feature is a new segment of BI that I call business monitoring. I've written a few reports on this. This is essentially assisted analytics on steroids. Instead of finding correlations, anomalies, or trends related to a single metric, business monitoring tools do this for hundreds of thousands or even millions of metrics on a continuous basis. So rather than having a single analyst in your back pocket, Business monitoring gives your executives and managers a team of data analysts that could, they could never afford to hire uh, otherwise. Best of all, these tools are easy to set up. They learn what's of interest to each and every individual using AI uh, techniques, and they generate relevant alerts in language that people can understand. So I think uh, quite a revolutionary development in our space. The final AI for BI feature uh, which is what we'll, Irina will be talking about, is what I call AI modeling wizards. This is where data science meets BI. These wizards make it possible for business users to create simple but powerful analytical models. These tools provide a graphical interface that step users through the process of creating a model. They do require some familiarity with statistics, but no coding or expert tuning of the models is required. These tools facilitate the creation of an army of citizens data scientists 
to augment your existing pool of usually high-priced uh, data scientists. So very shortly, Orla will demonstrate these four capabilities using SAP Analytics Cloud. Now, if you've worked in any organization of any size and used new information technologies, you know that adoption of those new tools, no matter how great, simple, or powerful they are, is not guaranteed. There are many reasons that users and organizations reject new technologies. They're too hard to use. They're too slow. They generate bad data. They don't do what I need them to do, and I don't have time to figure it out. <laughs> Those are some of the comments that I've heard, and I'm sure you've heard over the years. And these issues are as true with augmented analytics or intelligence as any other technology. For example, in the augmented intelligence space, I've started to hear the phrase fear of search to describe the challenge that some users experience when using search-based BI tools. So even a Google interface to BI can overwhelm some classes of user. So this chart is an adoption framework. And I created this a long time ago and updated it recently. It shows six key change management factors required to ensure business users and organizations adopt any new technology, including augmented intelligence. You need to excel in each of these six areas to succeed and ensure adoption. Missing one of them really jeopardizes the whole process. Uh, the technology must be easy to use, it must perform as expected uh, by the users, and it must generate what users perceive as high quality data. To talk about three of these success factors. On the softer side of the equation, organizations must put in place sufficient training programs and support networks, and they need to create a communications plan to generate a culture of change by appealing to people's heads, their hearts, and to the herd. That's a familiar change management tactic or principle that I often talk about, which we don't have time to go into today, but I'd love to talk if you're interested. Now, without sophisticated change management plans and strategies, any new technology will struggle to gain traction with a majority of your users. So you can learn more uh, about augmented intelligence and the framework I just discussed in a new report. Uh, you can download the white paper uh, at uh, SAP's website at this URL. And now I would like to turn this over to Orla to show you augmented intelligence features of SAP Analytics Cloud. So take it away, Orla. Excellent. Thanks very much, Wayne. So I think Wayne touched upon kind of four key aspects of what we talk about when we talk about augmented analytics. So I want to kind of step through them one by one, relating them back to what we actually have in SAP Analytics Cloud. Um, so the very first one I think that was mentioned was the round natural language query. And within SAP Analytics Cloud, we have a feature we call Search to Insight. And the beauty of this is you can kind of launch it from anywhere. You can launch it from the home page. So as soon as you log into Analytics Cloud, it's there or it's ever ready on our toolbar. So whether you're in a story or you're in a data model, you can actually go and start asking business questions of your data. But if we go into the global search, what's really powerful here is this is actually going to search all the available models that I have in Analytics Cloud. I don't have to choose one. I can just pick whatever I want, whatever I have access to, it will find for me. So if I start looking at, for example, gross margin, it's bringing back all the gross margin or all the links to gross margin I have all across um, Analytics Cloud. And what it brings me back is, first of all, just a figure for gross margin, but also it's a calculated measure. So it's explaining to me how it's calculated. So as we can see here, cost of goods sold by net revenue. Um, every time I go to type again, um, it does this type ahead where it's trying to select uh, or propose to me what I might want to look at next. And this is based on what other users have done and what I've done in the past as well. And one of the things you'll see here is straight away, it actually proposes a type of chart. So for this case, it figures that a bar chart actually makes sense for me as well. Now the language part is actually very important. So here you can see it understands things like top five, bottom 10, lowest, highest, rank and sorted, and enables me to actually use really natural language for me to actually interact with those things. The other thing just to mention quickly is it is proposing at every stage a chart for me. So for example, we saw just previously that it gave me as standard a bar chart, but maybe I don't really want a bar chart, maybe I want a heat map. So at any stage I can interrupt and say, well, actually, no, I'd like to see that as a heat map. Um, one of the things to mention as well is understanding what chart it's gonna bring back. So if I look at something like gross margin and I type something like over time, 
Um, I don't actually even have to select the time dimension. It's find month, so it's going to use month as a time dimension. And as you can see here, it's brought me back a line chart. So again, it's quite intuitive. Based on what I'm typing, it's bringing me back at what makes sense. I can add in more dimensions. So here I can see my gross margin and time and country in a, in a chart all together. The other thing it does understand is using kind of expressions. So for example, again, if I'm looking at my gross margin, my customer, but maybe I want to be very specific about which customers I want to see. So here we have a big long chart, um, but maybe I want to be really clear and say, I only want to see the customers that maybe have a gross margin with me greater than, say, for example, 500K. And it's doing two things here. One, it's understanding the greater than or equal to, um, but also it understands K just being a thousand. So something very, very simple you do in everyday life. But I can use other operators, like I can say between 400K and 500K, and immediately those filters are applied to my chart. At any stage, I can actually drop these charts into a story or I can export them as well, so they're always reusable for me. Um, one other thing that's important is also understanding um, time dimension. So I can say in this particular, this particular search, last year. And I don't have to actually specify that we're in 2021, we know that. So it automatically knows that it wants me to get bring, or wants to bring back data from 2020. I can also say last nine months, uh, I recorded this in April, so it's giving me March to July. But I can also say last two weeks, you know, uh, these type of operators, which are you know, generally how people speak. Finally, every company has their own way of speaking. They have their own terminology. And sometimes we can use multiple terms to describe the same thing. So we also have the ability to add synonyms into here. So for example, I might call it cost, you might call it field cost, but I don't actually have to re-engineer my data model. All I need to do is actually add all these synonyms in here and I can uh, make sure every time the next time a user searches, they find the, the correct term. Um, if I have a lot of these, I could import a file. So a big file can be imported and we can see all of these details as well. So at every stage, we're trying to simplify and allow the customer to use their own language and not push them into using kind of, you know, analytical terminology or, or, or you know, technical language. At every stage, it should be something we may ask as normal. So this is our um, desktop app, which I've just shown you there, but we also have this capability on our mobile devices as well. So everything you just saw there about uh, typing a question and, being, and bringing an answer back, we can also do on our mobile device, but we have one extra nice little feature here, which is the ability to actually speak into our mobile phone. So not only do we want to be able to type in an, an instruction, but we can also speak it in. So again, here I'm looking at gross margin by location. It's bringing back a number of charts. I can start to figure which one makes the most sense for me to use. And again, I can save all of these to my mobile device as well. As this is a mobile device at any time, I can actually share these items as you would with any other mobile content. I can annotate it. And one other thing to mention is if I start to type again, it's looking across all my available models. So gross margin may exist in a number of different places and I can simply choose the one that makes sense to me. Again, sometimes we might be speaking maybe in a crowded room or we might be speaking, maybe we have a strong accent and it may not exactly understand what we've just said. We have down here the keyboard icon that enables us to maybe just tweak what we've just said so we get the de desired information back as well. So again, super easy to use, everything you'd expect to use at a mobile phone. And the other important thing to mention here is um, we may be maybe at a Wi-Fi or we may be on a plane. Um, with our mobile device, it will remember the last 10 searches that we had, so it'll be available for us there on our device. Hi, Orla, uh, very impressive. Uh, one question, I, I mentioned fear of search in my little opening remarks. This seems very intuitive. Uh, are there any operators that people need to know before they start? Uh, are there any places that, you know, any training that's required? I mean, it seems very intuitive. No, I mean, this is, we expect people to be able to do it on the go, you know, I mean, I didn't show everything today, but there's also even recommendations about what you've looked at before. There's recommendations about what other people looked at that are searching the same things as you. So you're never starting from scratch, really. Um, and also at any point, which I didn't show earlier, if you pick a model, it'll show you all of the dimensions that are there. So you're not just guessing. So for example, if you picked your gross margin, you picked a model, it will show you all the different dimensions that you could slice and dice by as well. Oh, terrific. Okay, it's very advanced. Great. So yeah, the voiced insight was just a, a, a recent one we had in Q1 of someone we're, we're quite excited about because, you know, people speak into mobile devices, we should really, it's, it, that's intuitive in itself.
Okay, so jumping a bit forward, we're going to have a quick look now at assistive analytics. So this is kind of looking at how we generate insights um, on our data, both stuff that's been embedded by a, a story designer, but also stuff we can do ourselves as well. And again, we're going to see what we call here natural language generation. So not just bringing you back numbers, bringing you back text you can understand. So the first thing we can see here is our designer has actually embedded a dynamic text token into the dashboard, where basically it's showing an insight into the chart we can see here. First thing you notice, it is a natural language. So we can see here it's saying racing has the highest product revenue, gives you a percentage. And if me as a user wants to see more, I can select on view more. And the smart insights panel comes out from the left hand side where I can start drilling through more information. So this is one where the designer, the story designer themselves has actually decided to kind of highlight this to me so I can actually go into it in more detail. However, as a user, I might want to do my own exploration. So if I go into another dashboard where I don't have any tokens uh, embedded, what I can do here is I can pick pretty much any data point within the story. And when I click on it, I have the option to create a smart insight. So again, we're going to do it on the data point. I'll talk about variance in just a second. And we jump straight into our insight panel. And the very first thing we see is how that data point has changed over time. Again, we see the natural language. And as, a, as our data set is actually organized by month, it defaults month as the time, uh, the time element that we're going to use. But that might not be correct for us. We might want to see it as date or as quarter or as year, and we can change that as is appropriate for ourselves. But we can see it over a period of time, how it's uh, rising or falling. The next thing it does is it looks at all the data surrounding that data point and tries to identify the insights that we may find interesting. So, for example, we see here that the currency seems to be a very high influencer. As you can see, it's nearly 91 percent of the overall sales. So we might want to look a bit deeper on that. So I can kind of go down the rabbit hole here and um, I can continue to click data point after data point and go deeper and deeper as much as I see fit. Um, with that in mind, we also have the way a back button. So if you want to go back at any stage, um, you can do that because you might get lost in your insights. But all of that is available there. And one thing I just didn't mention is at any point, if you find an interesting chart, you can actually drop that into your story as well. Another thing we uh, added quite recently was not just looking at a data point, but maybe looking at planning models where we might have multiple versions. For example, we could have you know, a plan version, actual budget, what have you, and we might want to see the difference between those. So in this case, we can see here our sales does have multiple versions. It has actual and it has budget. So maybe we want to see what is impacting the difference between our actual and our budget. So it brings back some of the additional criteria within the sales that may be impacting where we are deviating between our forecast and our budget. So here we can see here um, claims or expense claims that are returned as false seem to be the ones that are causing the most variance between what we forecasted and what actually happened. So that's quite interesting for us to see. And again, if we wanted to drop this back onto our canvas, we could do that as well. OK, so that is our insights. OK, so the next one we're going on to, this is where we're going to go a little bit deeper. So we're really going to start um, allowing the user to interact with the predictive model. So they're not going to need any specific training or anything, but they actually are going to be supplying parameters to a predictive model. And in this case is what we call our smart discovery. So this is where a user maybe has more access than just viewing a dashboard or de de delving through um, different insights, but they can actually go into Smart Discovery and ask a very specific business question of their data. So the first thing they want to do is what is their target? What is the piece of inf or what is the dimension or measure they're most interested in? So in this case, we're going to look at our gross margin again, but not just that, we might want to see in gross margin in context of another entity, maybe our customer, maybe by country. We can apply filters, we can do advanced settings. And then what's important here is we can actually do a preview. And the reason the preview is important is because I'm about to send this information into the back end where it's going to do um, in automatically do a lot of data preparation. It is going to give this information to a predictive model. Um, it could either be a classification or a regression. Um, it's our automated predictive library behind the scenes, but it could take some time to run. So it's making sure I understand the question I've asked. So here we have down here, we can see uh, the information about whether or not we are comfortable with the question we've asked. And if we are, we can simply kick it off. So as I said, behind the scenes, we could have you know, quite a big data set and this will go and create a predictive model for me. 
So for demo purposes, I've sped it up. And what it brings me back is four, basically four pages, um, a combination of statistical analysis and machine learning. So at the top, we can see it's mostly statistical. So we're seeing, first of all, the total number of customers we have, the minimum value, the maximum value, and also the distribution um, over the gross margin. Um, below, we have used the gross margin over time, and we've also done a time series forecast, giving us two additional months worth of data. So again, it's shown us uh, what's happening up until a certain point, and then using a forecast to go further. It also gives us kind of a breakdown of our top 10 customers. And as you can see, it has embedded some Smart Insight uh, text token at the very bottom here, giving us a good view of what's happening across this whole data set. So this is the first page, which gives us an overview, gives us all the information we can use. And um, effectively, we can then move on and start to look through all the different things that happened here. Uh, one of the first things I'll mention as well is we actually have trained this model and what it'll bring us back is even some of the model metadata. So the first thing we can see is our key influencers. So what are the things in our data that are having the most impact on our gross margin? So we can see here customer segment, number of employees, they're having a big impact so we can go a bit deeper. Here we can see for the customer segment our Fortune 500 is definitely having a very big impact on our overall margin. Going into unexpected values, I think this is a very interesting uh, page we have. And what we've done here is we have taken the, da the data for gross margin by customer. We have run a model across it historically, and we've identified areas where the forecast differs significantly from what actually happened. So these are kind of anomaly detection, if you like. So here we can see there's a couple of data points that are kind of outside what we would have expected. And there's many reasons for this. The machine can only know so much. We know more about our what happened with our customers day to day. It's not all statistical and we can understand that as well. Final page we have is around um, simulation. So here we can see, as we mentioned earlier, the different variables that are having the most influence on our data. And we can mess change with those to see what the impact would be. So we knew the contact level was important. So if we move the contact level in this case from a C-level executive down to a manager level, we can see a 35% decrease in our overall margin. So we know that the level of contact that we have with our customers has a very big impact on whether or not we're successful. So we can play around with these figures and that can maybe help us understand how we go forward with new opportunities with our customer. So Orla, that, that's fantastic. Uh, one thing I'm, I've always been confused about uh, with both your uh, assisted insights and business monitoring, you're selecting one metric. So what's the real difference between the two? It sounds like the business monitoring and doing much more, you know, many more types of analyses and sometimes directed analyses. Is there anything else? Yeah, I mean, to be quite quite frank, the Smart Insights is actually using statistical um, methods behind the scene. It's what it's doing is a huge amount of computation um, to find what the top insights actually are. With this business monitoring, we are properly using algorithms behind the scene to actually calculate things like outliers, um, key influencers and forecasts. So one, I suppose, is, is very much focused on one data point and how the world reflects around that data point. Whereas what we're doing in the second instance is looking at the, the whole data set and actually running an algorithm across the whole data set. Gotcha. Thank you. Sure. Okay. And then last but no means least, and it's a nice uh, segue into what Irina is going to go through, is um, our predictive planning. So we've had Smart Predict for some time. That's our wizard approach to allowing users to um, create their own models. Um, but we've now integrated that into the world of our planning. So here we have a typical uh, planning table. So we can see our actual, our budget, um, previous forecasts that we've done, and we can see them populated over here. We have a, um, a selected version, which is our smart prediction. So as we can see, Q1 has already been populated because Q1 has passed, but we would like to know what's going to happen with Q2, Q3, and Q4. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to jump into our smart predict, uh, our wizard. Um, so again, there, this can be, person that uses this can have varying degrees of knowledge of predictive models. Um, and as you can see, so if I'm quite a simple user, I want to do a time series forecast. The first thing I need to do is pick my data source. So now as, as of the last couple of quarters, we can now use planning models, which is very, very important um, to our customers. So we pick our planning model and then we pick a version. So again, this is our actuals. Is it our budget? Is it our, you know, what other information we might have there? So in this case, we're going to use our actuals. So the actual data that's just passed, and we're going to use that to do to train our model. 
Now the, the figure we want to forecast is our sales revenue and we also want to know what, what date. So it's smart enough here to know within my data set what my time dimensions actually are. So as you could see for Q1 we had three periods and we wanted to do three more quarters. So that's nine months. So we put nine forecasts in here. And also this is very important part. It'd be very easy for us to just run a time series forecast against all of our sales revenue um, for the year and get nine months worth of information. But what does that actually really tell us? You know, to be able to break that down by other dimensions is extremely important. So in this case, we're going to break it down by product, which is our bike type, and we're also going to break it down by region. So what does that mean? It basically means that we're going to create an individual time series forecast for each and every combination of region and bike type. So it's really going to give us, you know, a real indication for each of those areas at what it is we're actually doing. So um, the training happens in the background. Again, it's our APL library. And as you can see, we have um, our, an individual forecast for each of those combinations. It's giving us the top entities and the bottom entities by the accuracy. So that's using our MAPE, which is our mean average percentage error. So the lower that is, the better we like it. So as we can see here, the e-bike in region four, it's 2.25%. That's, that's a good uh, MAPE that we like. And as we can see, maybe for China, it's a little bit higher. So it's important for when we put this back into our planning dashboard that we take this, we keep this in mind. Again, as I mentioned, um, this does, you know, it caters to different types of you know, levels of knowledge of data science. I might really want to go in and see a lot of information about the signal, uh, the trends, the cycles, what's actually happening amongst the data sets. I want to see some statistics and go through that in a lot of detail. And that's something I can do because I know we know that more and more with the citizen data scientists, they want to go a little bit further. They want to understand a bit more about their data. And so they can drill into each and every one of those forecasts and see more about it. When we're done, we need to save this back in. So this forecast will be saved back in um, as our smart prediction version. And once we've done that, we can uh, just click save and it's now back into our planning model. Okay, so we wanna see this in context of um, the rest of our planning dashboard. So as we go back in, we hit refresh. And now we can see those predictions for Q2, Q3, and Q4. And we also have a nice little delta bar at the end that shows us the difference between what was forecast and also what actually happened. And um, what's interesting to see here is um, most of our planners, and I think Irina will probably go into more detail on this, you know, the, the machine learning can take us so far, but we also know a lot about our own, we're domain experts in our own area. They can adjust those as, as they see fit. And that was the end that I had. I think it might be a nice segue into uh, Irina to talk a bit more about her practical um, examples with uh, predictive planning. Thank you, Orla. So maybe I can say a few words about Roche. So Roche is a um, global healthcare company with more than 120 years of history in developing novel treatments and diagnostics for its patients. It is employing more than 100,000 uh, employees and uh, it invests heavily in research and development. So above 20% of the sales are invested in R&D. So Roche is really focused on innovation and new technologies as it's also a pioneer in personalized healthcare. Great, Irina, thanks for uh, sharing that about Roche. Um, sorry, your graphic didn't display. That's that's a real anomaly. I have to talk to Zoom about that. Uh, so we're going to have a little uh, dialogue at this point, uh, and I know you have an architecture graphic, so you just tell me when you want to share that. But maybe you could explain first, uh, since we're talking about predictive planning and you're using the SAP tool to do that, what was going on before you implemented this product? What was your process like? What were the pain points that you experienced? It caused you to implement this new technology? So for this specific use case, the target audience was finance and the process was very time consuming, consuming and manual for the finance users. So there were several finance units who had different tools and different processes when they were forecasting their functional spend. And it required more than several weeks to enter manually the future forecast for the cost. It was also very unharmonized process, so you could hardly know what is the true data that was planned. And 
the challenge was that the people were really spending a lot of time on activity that was not that valuable at the end. So it sounds chaotic and no value add coming out of that situation. So then you explored solutions. You ended up with uh, SAP's uh, Analytics Cloud. And we talked about AI modeling wizards, of which this is an example. Uh, so tell us what changed after you implemented the predictive planning solution. So the implementation of SAP Analytics Cloud went along process improvement. So in addition to the implementation, also the different finance units decided to harmonize their process. So as a result, we had one single solution for the whole finance. It automated a lot of the work that they have done previously manually. And it, as a result, it saved a lot of time for them. They were able now to invest this time in really valuable activities in instead of just spending time on forecasting some numbers that were not that accurate at the end. It also brought a lot of improvements in the accuracy. So we gained about 10% improvement in the accuracy when compared to the manual forecast that was done earlier. And in terms of gaining the time, our finance users were able to forecast 4 billion for just two hours when comparing weeks on that earlier in the previous manual process. So you could forecast more frequently. Uh, you saved everybody a lot of time. You had one planning model <laughs> that everyone could agree yeah. on and better accuracy. Sounds like a win. <laughs> yeah, it was actually a quick win for us. Yeah, and how long did it take from start to finish to get that up and running? So it was an iterative process. We had uh, several proof of concepts before coming to the productive solution. Uh, and the whole process took uh, about half a year, including the proof of concepts and going live with the initial solution for finance. Uh, so six months. And did you roll it out everywhere at once or did you roll it out uh, bit by bit? We rolled it out bit by bit. Actually, we are still uh, implementing some improvements on the overall process. So we started with uh, one high level design and later on we improved with delivering additional pieces and uh, planning input templates for the users. So it's really delivered in an agile manner. So we, we had uh, initial productive MVP, and now it's being improved. Did you run into any challenges when implementing the tool, either technical or cultural? We, yeah, we did have challenges. One of the main challenges is what you mentioned is with the adoption of the end users. So it's not that easy to change the mindset of the people. And as it is finance and they're really loving Excel, they, it was a challenge for them to accept the new user, user interface. Mm -hmm. But what we did to mitigate that was uh, a lot of explanation and training for the end users on how this can benefit for it, what could be the benefit for them in having the new approach. And uh, we also, in one of the proof of concepts that we did, we did a comparison between the prediction and what they have done manually earlier. So basically we were forecasting data for historical periods and we were comparing uh, what the users manually entered against the actuals and also against the prediction. And uh, we did this comparison not only with the SAP Analytics Cloud, but as well with some open source models in Python, like Sarima and Prophet. And all the predictions were much more accurate than the manual forecast. This was a proof for the end users that not worth to spend that much time in this manual activity if you can automate it. And in addition, you have better results. Another challenge that we faced from the technical side is because of the new technology that we were not leveraging earlier with SAP Analytics Cloud. There was a learning curve for the developers as well. So 
we spend some time on understanding how it should work the best. An example for this is um, data preparation phase that was needed for optimized predictive planning. And we spent some time on wondering how we can have that implemented into one single solution. And here we got really good support from SAP product management. So we were advised to use something which is called data actions. So we were able really to have one integrated solution within SAP Analytics Cloud that was delivering both the preparation phase for the data and the prediction and the planning. Excellent. So just to be clear, I mean, you did bring developers in to help implement new capabilities for the application and, and the tool set, but end users, business users are the ones who are using this to create the models, right? So you don't need specialists to come in and, and do these forecasts, right? Programmers and things. Yeah, so one of the evaluation that we did when we were comparing uh, the results of the proof of concepts was the ease of use. And it's true that with uh, this solution with uh, SAP Analytics Cloud Predictive Planning, you don't need a data scientist. So you don't need to have a deep knowledge into machine learning to get this result. If you're interested, you can look at error metrics that are out of the box and uh, graphics that Ola showed earlier but it's not a necessity and you can save some time into a heavy data science project. So maybe for our viewers, you can discuss uh, the architecture of the solution and let me forward mm -hmm. here. Okay, the graphic does work here. So okay. This is the so architecture. So maybe you could step us through it quickly. Yeah, so this is the high level architecture at the moment. As I said, the solution is evolving, so it might change a bit over time. Uh, what was really beneficial in our use case was that we did have the historical data already available in our BW system. So all the actual costs uh, were available. Um, there was no need newly design of an ETL. Maybe this is what really accelerated the, the whole implementation. So we take these historical actual costs and headcount data and we load it into planning model in SEC. There we do the data preparation with the data actions as we mentioned, and afterwards we run the smart predict through this predictive scenario and we save back the prediction into the planning model into a separate version, planning version. And from there, the users take out the data and uh, look if any adjustment is needed. In our case, there are only 30% of the data that is being modified by the users. So basically the majority of the data they take as it is proposed by SmartPredict and only adjust the numbers on some specific costs for which they have the latest knowledge. And one good, good example is maybe the COVID-19 situation because you know, it dramatically changed some uh, costs, for example, for travel. And in this case, the predictive model was not able to detect this changing, this change of the data, of the historical data and um, the business knowledge on the current situation was coming to correct those numbers. This, was, this is, of course, true at the time when we did that test. I know that SAP recently released some smoothing techniques to improve such disruptive time series. So the product is evolving as well. So after we have the data on in the planning model and also adjusted by the users, we send it back to BW because it's just a design decision on our side uh, to report back the data with live connection. So then the data is stored in the BW system and it is reported in SAP Analytics Cloud as well. That allows us to complement the data with some different data sets on the BW site, which we use for data integration. So like the Kelly Blue Book story, it sounds like most users trust the output of the model and only change some of the fields uh, in the planning section uh, when things are unusual. <laughs> You know, things are changing unusually on the ground. So you said 30%? Yeah, so with the latest 
planning event that we had, it was 30% of the data points were adjusted. So 70% were left as they were proposed by Smart Predict. Great. So last question before we open up to questions, and we have quite a few. How important is it to have a, a strong vendor partner uh, to pull off something like this? Of course, it is very important. Uh, as I mentioned, we had a really strong support from SAP product management do, during the development. So they were advising us on how to proceed with the implementation. And also they were really quickly fixing some of the issues that we faced. And not only fixing uh, some small issues, but as well providing enhancements and listening to our struggles and releasing new functionality that really helped to progress that fast. As I mentioned, this COVID-19 improvements of the time series, and there are many more actually that happened during the project development. Okay, well, great. Let's move on to our Q&A section. Boy, Zoom is really not liking our graphics at the end of this presentation. Uh, there should be a little puppy dog there with its ear up asking you to uh, submit your questions. Uh, and we have a few here. And Aura, it looks like you answered some I've already. I've been answering a few while you guys were talking. <laughs> yeah. Was there anyone, if you want to, maybe you could share one that you did answer for the benefit of everyone on the line? Yeah. I mean, I think um, one of the first one was about um, how we deploy AI models uh, or augmented functionality into company systems. So I just kind of commented a little bit how one of the key metrics we're looking at is with Analytics Cloud is the ability to connect with other and multiple SAP applications to, to enable these dashboards either to be uh, created uh, using feeds from these systems, but in other cases, we actually are embedding some of this functionality directly within there. I don't know if you wanna go a bit further on that one with integration with other systems. That sounds good. Um, was there another one that you answered that you would like to share? Or, or I'll um, pick one out that's new. How about you You browse to them? I'll, I'll pick a new sure. one out. And and for those of you still on, if you have any questions for uh, Arena, that would be great to send them in right now. Uh, although I think she did a wonderful job summarizing exactly uh, what happened in that case. Uh, let's see. When do we think that the functions of planning et cetera, within SAC could potentially replace BPC, as I understand the current SAP recommendation for a new BPC implementation is so far on BW4. So a little bit of a technical migration okay. question here. Yeah, that's fine. And I, I know Mike. Hi, Mike. How are you, how are you doing well? <laughs> He's an old colleague of mine. Um, <laughs> yeah, so good question, Mike. Um, being very frank, for BPC, we are still recommending for on-premise solutions that you continue with BW4. We are working tirelessly to you know, widen the SAP Analytics Cloud planning function, and that is intended to be our cloud-based planning tool. So if you are migrating to S4 HANA Cloud or you're using any of the other SAP Cloud products, um, SAP Analytics Cloud would be the option for you. I think actually um, a lot of companies are moving to S4, so in which case SAP Analytics Cloud is, is best place for that. Um, if you are really Really looking for the on-premise with VW, continue to use BPC. Those solutions are still being developed in parallel, one being very cloud-focused, one, one really looking at an on-premise integration. Uh, and here's a question from Ala. Uh, would you please elaborate on how augmented analytics used ML AI techniques to transform how analytics content is developed, consumed, and shared, automate data preparation, insight discovery and sharing, data science, and ML model development, management, and deployment? So the whole kit and caboodle. <laughs> a lot in that. Um, but let me pick, pick out a few key topics because I think the automated data preparation for me is a very important one because yeah. everybody wants to use ML and AI, but if your data is not in the right format, you're, it's just not going to work for you. So one of the key things we've been working on, particularly with the business monitoring, was when you pick a question, we have to do things behind the scenes like flatten that data, flatten down hierarchies, pivot that so that we can actually feed it through a mathematical algorithm. So yeah, that is absolutely something that we're doing for you behind the scenes because it's where most people fail. 80% is data prep in, in ML, as we know. Okay. Um, so that's been a huge part of, of doing that. Um, for the insight discovery, they were actually, that's mostly statistical, again, that we're just, we're using a lots of complex formulas to do that work for you, again, behind the scenes. Because we have HANA, we can do it nice and fast. And then and we do that as well. Data science and model deployment uh, development. Yeah, you kind of saw the wizard there by picking um, at every stage, you know, what version we wanted, what 
what you know what filters we wanted to do actually the user is doing a certain amount of the orchestration now obviously behind the scenes we are doing the prep but they are actually deciding i want this to be my signal i want this to be my time point i want these to be my filters i want these to be my segments and they're actually telling us what they want without having to do it and we're actually doing it for them in the background all right. Uh, last question, I think. Uh, you already answered this, but Rishi commented, love the mobile product. How long does it take to build a model? Say if we want to build a model for a CFO's office, how long is the implementation time? And does it work with handheld de devices? Well, the modeling itself doesn't work with the handheld devices. You would have to be using the, the application to build out the models. It's a bit like how long is a piece of string, really? I mean, if you have simple data models coming through, it can be very, very easy and quick. You know, you load in your data or you connect and you maybe do some, but there's cases where there's quite a lot of data wrangling needed, in which case there that could take you some time. And also we have some good use cases where we're blending data from, for example, finance and HR, and bringing that together, blending it, you know, making sure the, gra the granularity, cardinality is all right. So those can take time. So I guess it just, um, it's, it's, sorry, it's not a great answer, but it just depends how complex your model is. If you have a straightforward kind of table or query or, you know, even a calculation view, you know, very quickly you can turn that into a model. It doesn't take a long time. It's where you need to tweak and change it um, is where that might take you a bit, a bit more effort. Okay, now this is the last question and this is for Irina. Antoine says, hi, Rena. Thanks for a great walkthrough in Roach's use case. This, is this correct that Roach is now leveraging SAP Analytics Cloud for analytics and planning capabilities, in addition to the predictive capabilities, targeting more and more the finance end users and providing them with a comprehensive end-to-end -end experience? Thanks, Antoine, for that question. So uh, we did have the initial phase when reporting was done on top of BW only. Like this was our first MVP. And at the moment, it is true that solution is evolving and we do have now the reporting or analytics on SAP Analytics Cloud as well. We are targeting SAP Analytics Cloud as the self-service and front-end solution for finance. And we are gradually moving all the functionality that was before um, in BW to SAP Analytics Cloud. And, and we expect even more functionality to be redesigned and moved to SAC. That's great. Great endorsement there. Um, uh, Orla, Irina, thank you so much for participating in this webinar and sharing your insights and knowledge. And I want to thank uh, the audience for tuning in. I hope you got a lot of value out of it. Until next time, have a great day. <laughs>